of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck, Chapter 6. The deep green pool of the Salinas River was still in the late afternoon. Already the sun had left the valley to go climbing up the slopes of the Gabalin Mountains, and the hilltops were rosy in the sun. But by the pool among the mottled sycamores, a pleasant shade had fallen. A water snake glided smoothly up the pool, twisting its periscope head from side to side, and it swam the length of the pool and came to the legs of a motionless heron that stood in the shallows. A silent head and beak lanced down and plucked it out by the head, and the beak swallowed the little snake while its tail waved frantically. A far rush of wind sounded, and a gust drove through the tops of the trees like a wave. The sycamore leaves turned up their silver sides, the brown dry leaves on the ground scudded a few feet, and row on row of tiny wind waves flowed up the pool's green surface. As quickly as it had come, the wind died, and the clearing was quiet again. The heron stood in the shallows, motionless and waiting. Another little water snake swam up the pool, turning its periscope head from side to side. Suddenly Lenny appeared out of the brush, and he came as silently as a creeping bear moves. The heron pounded the air with its wings, jacked itself clear of the water, and flew off downriver. The little snake slid in among the reeds at the pool's side. Lenny came quietly to the pool's edge. He knelt down and drank, barely touching his lips to the water. When a little bird skittered over the dry leaves behind him, his head jerked up and he strained toward the sound with eyes and ears until he saw the bird. And then he dropped his head and drank again. When he finished, he sat down on the bank with his side to the pool, so that he could watch the trail's entrance. He embraced his knees and laid his chin down on his knees. The light climbed on out of the valley, and as it went, the tops of the mountains seemed to blaze with increasing brightness. Lenny said softly, I didn't forget, you bet. Goddamn. Hide in the brush and wait for George. He pulled his hat down low over his eyes. George gonna give me hell, he said. George gonna wish he was alone and not having me bothering him. He turned his head and looked at the bright mountain tops. I, I could go right off there and find the cave, he said. And he continued sadly. And never have no ketchup, but I won't care. If George don't want me, I'll go away. I, I'll go away. And then, from out of Lenny's head, there came a little fat old woman. She wore thick bullseye glasses, and she wore a huge gingham apron with pockets. And she was starched and clean. She stood in front of Lenny and put her hands on her hips, and she frowned disapprovingly at him. And when she spoke... It was in Lenny's voice. I told you, and told you, she said. I told you, mind George, because he's such a nice fella and good to you. But you don't never take no care. You do bad things. And, and Lenny answered her. I tried, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I tried and tried. I couldn't help it. You never give a thought to George, she went on in Lenny's voice. He been doing nice things for you all the time. When he got a piece of pie, you always got half or more than half. And if there was any ketchup, why well, he'd give it all to you. I know, said Lenny miserably. I tried, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I tried and tried. She interrupted him. All oh, the time he could have had us such a good time if it wasn't for you. He would have took his pay and raised hell in the whorehouse, and he, he could have sat in the pool room and played snooker, but he got to take care of you. Lenny moaned with grief. I know, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I'll go right off in the hills and I'll find a cave and I'll live... Live there so I won't be no more trouble to George. You just say that, she said sharply. 
You're always saying that, and you know, some of them it seem well, you ain't never gonna do it. You just uh, stick around and just do the Jesus out to George all the time. Lenny said, I might just as well go away. George ain't gonna let me tell no rabbits now. Aunt Clara was gone, and from out of Lenny's head there came a gigantic rabbit. It sat on its haunches in front of him, and it waggled its ears and crinkled its nose at him, and it spoke in Lenny's voice, too. Ted Rabbit, it said scornfully, you crazy bastard, you ain't fit to lick the boot. Of no rabbit. You'd forget them and let them go hungry. That's what you do. And then what would George think? I would not forget, Lenny said loudly. The hell you wouldn't, said the rabbit. You ain't worth a grease jack pin to ram you into hell. Christ knows George done everything he could to jack you out of the sewer, but it don't do no good. If you think George gonna let you ten rabbits, you're even crazier than usual. He ain't. He's gonna beat hell out of you with the stick. That's what he's gonna do. Now Lenny retorted belligerently, He ain't neither. George would do nothing like that. I, I've never, I, I knew, I knew George since I forget when and... He never raised his hand to me with his stick. He did. He nice to me. He ain't gonna be mean. Well, he's sick of you, said the rabbit. He's gonna beat hell out of you, and then you go away and leave you. He won't, Lenny cried frantically. He won't do nothing like that. I know, George. We have traveled together. But the rabbit repeated softly, over and over, He gonna leave you, the crazy bastard. He gonna leave you all alone. He gonna leave you, crazy bastard. Lenny put his hands over his ears. He ain't. I tell you, he ain't. And he cried, Oh, George. 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 George came quietly out of the brush, and the rabbit scuttled back into Lenny's brain. George said quietly, What the hell are you yelling about? Lenny got up on his knees. You ain't gonna leave me, are you, George? I, I know you ain't. George came stiffly near and sat down beside him. No. I know that, Lenny cried. You ain't that kind. George was silent. Lenny said, George? Yeah? I, I done another bad thing. Yeah, it don't make no difference, George said, and he fell silent again. Only the topmost ridges were in the sun now. The shadow in the valley was blue and soft. From the distance came the sound of men shouting to one another. George turned his head and listened to the shouts. Lenny said, G George? Yeah? Ain't you going to give me hell? Give you hell? <laughs> sure, like you, you always done before. Like if I didn't have you, I'd uh, take my 50 bucks and... Jesus Christ, Lenny. You can't remember nothing that happens, but you'll remember every word I say. Well, ain't, ain't you going to say it? George shook himself. He said woodenly, If I was alone, I could live so easy. His voice was monotonous, had no emphasis. I could get a job and not have no mess. He stopped. Go, go on, said Lenny. And when the end of the month come, and uh, when the end of the month come, I could take my 50 bucks and go to a cat house. He stopped again. Lenny looked eagerly at him. Go, go on, George, and can you, can you give me no, no more hell? No, nah, said George. But I, I can go away, said Lenny. I'll go right off in the hills and I'll find a cave if you don't want me. George shook himself again. No, he said. I want you to stay here with me. Lenny said craftily. 
t tell me like you you done before. Tell you what? But but the uh, other guys and and about about us. George said, "Guys like us got no family. Make a little stake and then they blow it in. They ain't got nobody in the world that gives a hoot in hell about them." But not us, Lenny cried happily. To tell about us now. George was quiet for a moment. But not us, he said. Because, because I got you and, and I got you. We, we got each other. That's what that gives a hoot and a hell about us. <laughs> Lenny cried in triumph. The little evening breeze blew over the clearing and the leaves rustled and the wind waves slowed up the green pool. And the shouts of men sounded again, this time much closer than before. George took off his hat. He said, shakily, Take off your hat, Lenny. Yeah, it feels fine. Lenny removed his hat dutifully and laid it on the ground in front of him. The shadow in the valley was bluer, and evening came fast. On the wind, the sound of crashing in the brush came to them. Lenny said, Tell how are we going to be? George had been listening to the distant sounds. For a moment, he was businesslike. Look across the river, Lenny, and uh, I'll tell you so you can almost see it. Lenny turned his head and looked off across the pool and up the darkening slopes of the cabalins. We're going to get a little place, George began. He reached in his side pocket and brought out Carlson's Luger. He snapped off the safety and the hand and gun lay on the ground behind Lenny's back. He looked at the back of Lenny's head, at the place where the spine and skull were joined. A man's voice called from up the river, and another man answered. G go on, said Lenny. George raised the gun, and his hand shook, and he dropped his hand to the ground again. Go on, said Lenny. How's it going to be? We, we can get a little place. We'll have a cow, said George, and we'll maybe... Uh, have a pig and chickens, and uh, down the flat we'll have a, a little piece of alfalfa. For the rabbits, Lenny shouted. For the rabbits, George repeated. And I get to tend the rabbits, and you get to tend the rabbits. Lenny giggled with happiness. And live on the fat of the land. <laughs> yes. Lenny turned his head. No, Lenny. Look down there across the river like you can almost see the place. Lenny obeyed him. George looked down at the gun. There were crashing footsteps in the brush now. George turned and looked toward them. Come on, George, when are we going to do it? I'm going to do it soon. Me and you. You and me. Everybody going to be nice to you. Ain't no going to be no more trouble. Nobody gonna hurt nobody, no steal from him. Lenny said, and I thought you was mad at me, George. No, said George. No, Lenny, I ain't mad. I never been mad, and I ain't now. That's the thing I want you to know. The voices came close now. George raised the gun and listened to the voices. Lenny begged, let's do it now, let's get that place now. Sure, right now, I gotta, oh, we gotta. And George raised the gun and steadied it, and he brought the muzzle of it close to the back of Lenny's head. The hand shook violently, but his face set and his hand steadied. He pulled the trigger. The crash of the shot rolled up the hills and rolled down again, Lenny jarred and then settled slowly forward to the sand, and he lay without quivering. George shivered and looked at the gun, and then he threw it from him, back up on the bank near the pile of old ashes. The brush seemed filled with cries, and with the sound of running feet, Slim's voice shouted, George, where are you at, George? But George sat stiffly on the bank and looked at his right hand that had thrown the gun away. The group burst into the clearing, and Curly was ahead. He saw Lenny lying on the sand. Got him, by God! He went over and looked down at Lenny, and then he looked back at George. Right in the back of the head, he said softly. Slim came directly to George and sat down beside him, sat very close to him. Never you mind, said Slim. 
A guy got to sometimes. But Carlson was standing over George. How'd you do it? He asked. I, I just done it, George said tiredly. Did he have my gun? Yeah, he had your gun. And you got him away from it and you took it and you killed him? Yeah, that's, uh, that's how. George's voice was almost a whisper. He looked steadily at his right hand that had held the gun. Slim twitched George's elbow. Come on, George. Me and you'll go and get a drink. George let himself be helped to his feet. Yeah, a drink, Slim said. You had to, George. I swear you had. Come on with me. He led George into the entrance of the trail and up toward the highway. Curly and Carlson looked after them, and Carlson said, Now what the hell you suppose is eating them two guys? Hmm. Well, smart.